Welcome to everyone. Today's video is on parliamentary procedure made easy. That word easy can be intimidating to the best. As a new parliamentarian, hopefully this will help us get through to help those who want to be a parliamentarian to take the plunge. I'm fortunate enough today to have Robin Pekorski, who is a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians with extensive experience to help us along. And I do want to welcome her and I want to say how much I appreciate. The first thing any organization has to follow are their federal and state laws. If they're an incorporated entity, then of course it's the state of their incorporation. That's number one. You can't break federal or state law within your organization. The next thing that's going to fall in place are your articles of incorporation, or sometimes it's called your corporate charter. And again, that only is if you are an incorporated entity, then you will have articles of incorporation, which describes your business. Um, basically, what kind of business it is. Is it a nonprofit? Is it a for-profit? But those are your articles of incorporation. After that, then your bylaws and your constitution fall into place. If you only have bylaws, that's next. If you have bylaws and a constitution, your constitution falls in place before your bylaws. After that comes your rules of order or your parliamentary authority. What rules are you to follow during your meetings if they aren't addressed in your bylaws? The next thing are your standing rules which basically are the administrative details of your bylaws. And last but not least is custom. It's not in your bylaws. It's not in your standing rules. It's something you've always done. But if it's not in your bylaws or your bylaws conflict, it can be challenged. And then you must go by your rules. So that's the order. I bring an example. I get information or I get questions from garden clubs and they'll call me as the parliamentarian they'll say well patty what does parliamentary procedure what does robert's rule say about such and such a procedure my first thing to them is what do your bylaws say your parliamentary your rules of order do not come into play until after you have exhausted what you have in your bylaws and your constitution as far as running your meetings or your procedures so now that we have that in order, we'll go one by one and we'll start with your bylaws. So why do we have parliamentary procedure in most organizations? To prevent chaos and to have business conducted smoothly and without too many interruptions. Another reason is to make sure that the majority is heard. The majority of your members need to have a voice Okay. Well, the minority of your members need to be recognized and absentees need to be recognized. So with parliamentary procedure, it gives us a wonderful outline of how to do probably one of the most difficult jobs there is to do in an organization, and that's to keep order. What is parliamentary procedure and why is it essential to an organization? The basic premise of parliamentary procedure is to prevent chaos within a meeting, to help the meeting run as smoothly as possible, and to be able to conduct a good substantive amount of business in the meeting. Okay. It's the right of the majority to decide what goes on in its organization. It's the right of the minority to be heard, and it's the rights of individual members that they all be recognized within the society. The rights of absentees also, if you don't want to attend a meeting, that's fine. You still have a right within the organization under parliamentary procedure. So Robin, what is abstention and when would someone abstain from voting? If you abstain from something, you are just going by whatever the majority wants. And say our garden club was going to uh, pay someone to uh, build some raised beds for us, grandson of a club member maybe. Then as 
as that club member, I might say, I, I abstain and I wish that to be noted in the minutes because yes. I don't want that to be seen that I'm voting for my grandson. You abstain from voting. You basically are not voting at all. It does not count as a no vote and you are going with the majority, whoever votes in the, in the negative or the positive. When do Robert's Rules of Order come into play for an organization? Robert's Rules is the default parliamentary authority if it's designated as your parliamentary authority. This is noted in your bylaws. Your bylaws are the most important ruling document, the highest level within your organization. Um, some organizations actually have a constitution instead of bylaws. Sometimes they have both. If an organization does have both, know that the constitution supersedes your bylaws. But in your bylaws, they should recognize what we call your rules of order. And that is the regulation of the conduct of the business and meetings. You want to note in your bylaws that it is a well-rounded manual that you're using. You want to use the best and most available, which in our opinion is Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, and the current edition is the 12th edition. If an organization does not have Robert's Rules of Order specified in their bylaws, do Robert's Rules of Order have any bearing on the organization? No. If they have to go by what their bylaws say, then that becomes their total set of rules. The thing with bylaws is that they are the basic rules for the organization. And in those basic rules, you want to describe the group's purpose. You want to tell what the qualifications or method of selection of members. How can they become a member of your society organization? Um, it should provide for your officers, for your committees, and your meetings. Um, it should always have, what does a quorum mean? Who makes up a quorum? Um, it can set up your um, board of directors, mm -hmm. and it should include provisions that you can change those bylaws. Because as we all know, especially through the pandemic, we've had to make some changes because the bylaws didn't cover what happens when um, we shut down. So a quorum. The quorum is the minimum number of members who must be present in a meeting in order to conduct business. This is very important to specify this in your bylaws. If you don't have a quorum present during a meeting, the business that can be conducted is very limited. You can set a meeting date, a meeting time, but you can't do anything toward the meat and potatoes of the meeting. If an organization doesn't specify that a quorum um, or what a quorum is in their bylaws, then the default is automatically set at a majority of the members, not of those who are in the meeting, but of the membership body. Yeah. Most people assume that a quorum is a majority of those present not a majority of those potentially present. Correct. That's why your bylaws must state for, say for instance, for an annual business meeting, um, the quorum is a hundred members uh, or a hundred folks of those registered. I mean, it, it has to be specific. You must have a specific number. And if you don't, you can't perform business. And that's something else that members need to know during a meeting, they think, oh, we're a couple people short. We can just go ahead and take care of business. No, you can't. The rule is the rule. It is the law of your organization. Patty, whose job is it to establish a quorum and to determine if a quorum has been met? Usually it would go by, by the registration and their credentials. It's very, very important that it is set in your bylaws. That's probably one of the most important things to put into your bylaws so that your organization can have a good business meeting and get things done without putting it off. That's why we have adopt the credentials report at our conventions. Yes. National does that. 
and we do that at our region and our state conventions. We adopt our credentials report, but not the registration report. That just tells us how many people are there. And that's recorded in the minutes also, because you have to remember too, that your meeting minutes are the legal representation of the business that you do in your organization. If someone comes back and says, this wasn't passed or this is not legal, this is your legal record. It's not just a typed paper in a notebook or a file on your computer. These are legal binding records that you must keep. What is the recommended guideline for establishing a realistic quorum for your organization? The general rule of thumb would be uh, the members, the number of members that can reasonably be expected to come out on a rainy night. So let's jump back to bylaws. What should not go in bylaws? Details. Details pertaining to the rule. You'll do details in what we call the standing rules. They are the details pertaining to your bylaws. You don't want to have so much detail in your bylaw that it's a novel and that people aren't really going to remember what you have in the bylaws. Say, okay, this says we have to meet one time a year. Now let's figure out when we have to meet. Let's actually designate a month or a week or a day per year. That would go in your standing rules. But bylaws are for the basic administrative rules of the organization. Just as a note, bylaws has no hyphen between the by and the laws. It's all one word. Again, don't ignore your bylaws. They are your governing document of your organization. Review them. Review them at least every five years. Um, you may want to have a specific committee just setting up for reviewing bylaws. What is meant by broken bylaws? Can you give me an example of that? Oh, yes, sure I can. We always have our meetings on the first Monday of the month, but that doesn't say they're electronic, does it? Mm -hmm. So at the first of the pandemic, we had to have our meetings on the first Monday of the month or we were in violation of our bylaws. So quickly we saw that we couldn't have our meetings, obviously, so we had to fix our bylaws. So you don't ignore them, you fix them. A lot of clubs I see, when I've visited clubs, they'll say, yeah, we're, we're supposed to do our, our budget this month, but the treasurer doesn't have it done. Now she never has it done by now. She always takes until January to get it done. Then fix your bylaws, make your bylaws say that you're, budget is presented in January instead of November if she can never get it done in time. That's so let's move on to standing rules. What are standing rules and how do they differ from policies and procedures? They're the little details, the administrative details that aren't important enough to make a bylaw. And again, as I was talking about the example, we're going to have our organization is required to have one meeting per year. Okay, the standing rule then gives you the little details because a standing rule can be suspended quickly. It can be changed quickly. For instance, if we had in the bylaws that the annual meeting is always going to be the first Monday of May each year. Okay, so the next year comes up and it's impossible to have it on that day. We can have it on the second Monday, but not the first. But we can't change it because our bylaws have to go through a substantial business procedure and voting to get changed by the membership. A standing rule on the other side, if we had put that in a standing rule that we're going to have on the first Monday of May, we can vote very quickly. To suspend that, you only need the vote of one of the governing bodies. And again, that can be outlined in your bylaws that, okay, we're gonna change it, we're gonna suspend it, or we're going to get rid of it very quickly so that we can have the meeting on the second Monday. So that's why you don't want to put details in your bylaws. You want to ad address the meat and potatoes of your organization and your bylaws, and your standing rules are there for detail. 
that can be changed very quickly. As Let's talk about that change. Um, okay. Bylaws generally require a general meeting of the membership, a quorum, et cetera. What do standing rules require to be updated or amended? Okay. A standing rule only needs a majority vote for adoption. To amend a standing rule takes either a majority vote if they have previous notice as outlined in your bylaws, or if they don't have previous notice, a two-thirds vote or a vote of the majority of the entire membership of the voting body. A bylaws generally have to go through a longer a uh, longer period of a, maybe a 30 day notice is standard and everyone needs to be uh, advised of a, a bylaw change coming up. A standing rule can be done at the same meeting. Even if nobody has known about this previously, you mm -hmm. could present this or this could be presented at a meeting and mm -hmm. two thirds of the people right there can change that standing rule. So standing rules can be changed often in one day, on one day, bylaws yeah. often on more of a month or more basis. So now we're talking about policy. And a lot of times clubs will group this as policy and procedure in one. But you have it separated, Robin. Very, they're very separate. Um, policy has, has often been used interchangeably with standing rules. And it is lumped together with procedure. Policy should be your motherhood statements. Those are the things that this club believes in the right tree in the right place. ABC Garden Club encourages water conservation. Those are your policies because if they are really standing rules, if they are administrative, get them over to standing rules. If they are how to do the job, get them over into procedures. See, and most of our clubs really don't have policies. They really have procedures, which they title policy and procedures. Mm -hmm. But if they do have policy, then be sure you have the teeth to it. And the teeth is how do who gets to adopt that policy? Who gets to change it? It doesn't have to have notice. Does it have to have a majority? If you're going to have policy, tell us how define it. Tell us who's going to adopt it. Who's going to change it? Go on to procedures. Procedures is how to do that job. So in your standing rules, you might have ABC Garden Club will support Arbor Day with the planting of the tree annually. Your, your, your procedures might say, well, we want to do this in March in California because that's when our Arbor Day is. And we want to get a tree donated from... The, the nursery down the road. That's your procedure. Don't put that in your standing rules. Okay, so procedures should never be in your bylaws. How to do something should never be in your bylaws or your standing rules. What about voting? Voting procedures? No, 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 no. National does that with, their, uh, with some of their procedures. That's per particular to national, to NGC. But for our clubs, they should not be. Now, if it has to do with money, spending money, unless it tells you, you know, your procedures can't tell you to spend money because that should be through your membership or through your budget process. But how to do it, how to go get, go get a tree donated from the nursery. No, we don't vote on that. And a lot of times with procedures in clubs, particularly certain committee members don't know what their job is. They know the title of their job, but they don't know how to do their job or mm -hmm. what they're supposed to be doing. And that's where a procedure would be very helpful. Yes. And of course, in a digitized world, uh, we all want it online on our websites or uh, just online. But let's not forget the just the old standby by a hard copy that I can hand you. Mm -hmm. um, we're, yes. we're updating our procedures in our club. They're 20 years old. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. You know, they're back in white gloves and getting corsages for the president <laughs> at every convention. <laughs> hey, time to move on. Time to update that. But when we did update it, and I, for example, I, I wrote them up for my club because I've 
kept in the club the longest. And I sent it out to each of the chairmen. I can't tell you how many chairmen I got back saying, emailing me back saying, I didn't know that was part of my job. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. We, so we don't want to sell people short with that and not have a good, complete, up-to-date procedure book. Okay. Well, so then that brings us to the most dreaded of all rules. The hardest possible rules to change. The most <laughs> entrenched of any of all of them. <laughs> it's the way we've always done it. But we've always done it that way, Robin. We don't know how to do it any other way because that's the way it's always been done. You got to get rid of that. <laughs> that mm. is the hardest to change. And so if you've been doing something one way and it's not in your bylaws and it should be, get it in your bylaws. If it's administrative, get it in your standing rules. And if it's procedure, put it in your procedure book because that's the way we've always done it. It's the hardest to change. But I say, don't try to get someone to stop doing it change your bylaws to what you do. Make your bylaws work for you. Don't let your bylaws and standing rules become restraining. Get them to work for you and your club. Good point. Good point. So what is uh, customs? There we are. And that's what it is. <laughs> this is the way we've always done it. It's the custom. Mm -hmm. Let's go mm -hmm. to the next one. I think a great example of that, if I might, is that at every meeting, we invite people to stand to say hello to the national president or the highest level of um, officer present, right? Yeah. And, and people don't understand that that, well, that's the custom of Garden Club. That's so the way we've always done it. A procedure. And I think those, I think these customs should be written down. They can be wherever they belong. Right. Generally, it's going to be in procedure. But I think that's, um, if we want to keep some of these customs, and I'm not saying they're bad, but if we want to keep these customs that we show respect to our national president or our state president or region director, let's get it written down so that we are teaching the ones coming after us. Otherwise, uh, those that have, those of us that are left standing there, we look pretty silly and the new people don't understand. So you help them along and you bring them along. I like stuff written down, but um, if nothing else, sit with your new people. And, and when your national president is visiting, you'll say, and of course we stand for mm -hmm. our national president when she's introduced. Mm -hmm. And that helps them. It helps it, you not look so silly, but it also helps them not look disrespectful when they're still sitting there. So that begs a question, which is not on our outline, and that <laughs> is, what is the job of the protocol chair? Because a lot of times what happens is the protocol chairman is trying to enforce the traditional customs, not necessarily the procedures. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I think um, protocols and, and amenities, we often put amenities and protocol together. Um, I think it's their job to help us be <laughs> the best we can be. Um, we had a, a, a amenities and protocol who was a tough little bird. She was tiny little thing and she's a tough little bird. She'd get up there and say, look, you're coming to a, a, a convention at a hotel. It may be colder than you want, bring a sweater. It may be hotter than you want, take off the sweater, but don't whine about the temperature. We're going to be standing. She would tell us the, the meeting ahead of time. We're gonna stand for our president when she's introduced. We don't eat until the presiding officer picks up her fork. It isn't the president incidentally, it is the presiding officer of the meal. Um, You've got to t tell us these things, otherwise new people aren't going to know. So right. is it time to let some of that go? Yeah, maybe, but maybe not. Maybe that's what makes some of it fun and, and a little bit special. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. So we do want to make sure that our bylaws and standing rules do reflect what is, what is done, it, done in your club. And custom is allowable 
even if it conflicts with your bylaws, which I thought was real interesting until it's challenged. Can you so give me my, an example? In my district, we have in our bylaws, it's very clearly written out in great detail about having delegates that vote. Okay, my district hasn't voted on anything but its budget and giving $100 to the president's project probably for the last 25 years. Okay. And yet we got somebody new in and they said, well, who's the delegates here? Who's allowed to vote? Oh my gosh, we've been doing it this other way forever. And it was fine until <laughs> it was challenged. And once it was challenged, now we have voting cards and now we have a registration mm -hmm. and we have credentials for a district meeting. I don't know about your district meetings, but ours aren't that formal. Mm -hmm. We don't have any business. <laughs> we report on what our clubs are doing. We get some ideas. We do a lot of networking, but we don't do a lot of voting. <laughs> right. So once it was challenged, um, you got to follow your bylaws. Okay. okay. And on that note, is there anything else that we need to say before we end? We love bylaws. We love standing <laughs> rules. And parliamentary procedure is not scary. It can oh. be your friend and it can help you and your club if you just have some basics under your belt. Thank you, Patty and Robin. If you would like more information, go to www.parliamentarians.org or www.robertsrules.org. This has been a workshop of the National Garden Clubs Incorporated.